Hi everyone, I'm Jeremiah Blanchard, and I'm going to talk to you about truth and logic. So, logical comparisons can be used to determine truth values via what we call propositional logic. And when we say that, a proposition is something that's either true or false, nothing more and nothing less. For example, the proposition, I am a stegosaurus, is false. But apparently the proposition, you can get free shoes in Tallahassee, is true. I hear there's a school there known as Free Shoes University. The proposition 10 is greater than 9,000 is false, but the proposition i to the power of i is a real number is true, and you can look that up. On the other hand, some things are not propositions. If I ask, what time is it? That's a question. If I say, Marston Library is better than Library West, that's an opinion. It happens to be the correct opinion, but it's an opinion. In propositional logic, we can also represent individual propositions using identifiers, which are just a type of name like any other. We can also build what we call compound propositions using connectives, and a connective is just a way that we join two propositions together in some logical way. The conjunction connective, also known as AND, uses a typical caret symbol, and if we have a proposition A and then another proposition B, the conjunction of A and B is typically read in English as A and B. Exclusive OR is a circle with a cross symbol in the middle, almost like a target radical. And in typical language, this translates into A or B, but not both. Negation reverses the value of a proposition, so we read it as not A. And implication uses a one-way arrow and is read A implies B. Finally, the biconditional uses a two-headed arrow and is read as A if and only if B. Sometimes you'll see this abbreviated as IFF. In this table, we can see that each proposition is represented by an identifier or a variable, and we also see the truth values of these various propositions. In this next table, we see a few examples of compound propositions. Green disjunction FSU would be read as all gators are green or players get free shoes in Tallahassee. To assess the truth value, we see that we have a false statement ORed with a true statement. And for or, if either of the propositions is true, then the compound proposition is true. So this compound proposition is true. Swamp conjunction what can be read as there are more than 9,000 memes and i to the i is a real number. This is the conjunction of a true and a false value, true and false. But for the conjunction to be true, both statements must be true. So this compound proposition is false. The negation of steg means it is not true that I am a stegosaurus. It's the negation of a false value, not false, which means it's true. So let's talk a little bit more about implication because it can be complicated. You may hear people read implication as if A, then B, but this can be a little bit misleading. Let's take a look at an example. The statement, the world is flat, implies zombies will take over, is actually a true statement. But why is that? Well, it turns out for implication, if the premise is false, then the implication itself is true. In other words, the consequence only matters if the premise is true. If the premise is false, the implication is always true. It might make more sense if you think about implication as a promise. If you give me a sandwich, then I will be your friend. In this case, if you don't give me a sandwich, I might still be your friend. It's only false if I break the promise. A biconditional is similar, but the condition goes in both directions. I'll be your friend if and only if you give me a sandwich. If the biconditional is true, if I'm your friend, then you must have given me a sandwich, because I wouldn't be your friend if you had not given me a sandwich. Now, logical connectives can be confusing, so we often describe them explicitly using what we call truth tables. And a truth table is just what it sounds like. It's a table that shows the truth values for each possible combination of propositions and connective. So the conjunction, and, is only true if both A and B are true, and in that case the conclusion is true. And we see in the table that true and true yields true, false and true yields false, true and false yields false, and false and false yields false. The disjunction, A or B, is true if either or both of the propositions are true. So if A and B are true, C is true. If A is false and B is true, C is true. If A is true and B is false, C is true. 
and only if a and b are both false is c false. And now we start to get to the slightly more complicated ones. For implication, you'll notice that if the premise is true and the consequence is true, then the compound proposition is true. But also, any time the premise is false, whether or not the consequence is false, the compound proposition is true. The only time when an implication is false, again, is when you break the promise. When A is true, but B is not, the implication as a whole is false. On the other hand, looking at the bidirectional implication, any time A and B match, the compound proposition is true, and any time they do not match, the compound proposition is false. The negation, not, simply flips the proposition. So if A is true, its negation is false, and if A is false, its negation is true. And then we come to the exclusive or, which we usually read as one or the other, but not both. And what we'll see is that if A is true and B is false, then the exclusive or proposition is true. Or if A is false and B is true, the exclusive or proposition is true. But if both A and B are true, or if both A and B are false, then the exclusive or is also false. Effectively, truth tables help us to lay out the explicit values of a compound proposition with perfect clarity. This is all well and good, but how do we apply it practically? Well, one of the most practical applications for propositional logic is what we call bitwise operators. The way bitwise operators work is that they act on individual bits of a value rather than the whole value. They treat a 1, on, as true, and a 0, off, as false. And many of these are based on proposition connectives. They also allow shifting or moving bits to the left or right. One major category of bitwise operations are those that act on pairs of values. And they take two different values, and they yield a third set of bits. In this example, we're going to use C++ and use the bit set from the standard template library in order to display the individual bits. But keep in mind that you could do this just by analyzing the individual bits themselves. Just an additional note here. When we use the bit set in C++, we put a number inside of the angle brackets, and that number indicates how many bits we want to display. In this case, it's 8, and that will limit the printout to those 8 bits. We'll start by generating two integer values. The variable called first will hold the binary value 01111100, and the variable called second will hold the binary value 01001101. The operator to perform a bitwise AND, a conjunction, is a single ampersand symbol. So if we AND first and second, what we will end up doing is looking at each individual pair of bits in the value first and second, and producing an individual bit as the output. If we take 0 AND 0, that's false AND false, which yields false. If we look at the next bit, it's 1 AND 1, and that yields a 1 value, or true. If we look at 1 AND 0, that's true AND false which yields false, or 0. And then again, if we look at 1 and 0, that's true and false, which yields a false, which is 0. So the result of our first four bits and the AND operation is 0, 1, 0, 0. We can apply the same logic to the second set of bits. 1 and 1 is 1, 1 and 1 is 1, 0 and 0 is 0, and 0 and 1 is 0, yielding 1, 1, 0, 0. If we want to, we can also display the decimal value of 01001100, which will be 76. Our other pairwise operations work basically the same way. Bitwise OR, the disjunction, uses a single pipe symbol. 0 or 0 is 0, 1 or 1 is 1, 1 or 0 is 1, 1 or 0 is 1, which gives us the first four bits of 0111. We look at the second four bits. 1 or 1 is 1, 1 or 1 is 1, 0 or 0 is 0, and 0 or 1 is 1, giving us 1101, or a decimal value of 125. Finally, we get to the exclusive OR, which is represented using the caret. Now, I know this can be a bit confusing, since the caret in typical mathematical notation represents the conjunction. It's just one of those idiosyncrasies of many programming languages. It's very typical to see the caret used as the exclusive or. Here we have 0 exclusive or 0, since they're both off, they're both false, that yields a 0. 1 exclusive or 1 again yields false, because remember, it's one or the other but not both. 1 exclusive or 0 is going to be a 1. 
Again, 1 exclusive or 0 is a 1, and so our first four bits are 0, 0, 1, 1. For the last four bits, 1 exclusive or 1 is 0, 1 exclusive or 1 is 0, 0 exclusive or 0 is 0, and 0 exclusive or 1 is 1, yielding a last four bits of 0, 0, 1, 1, or to look at the whole value, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, decimal value 49. The other major set of bitwise operations act on individual values. In other words, they are unary operators. And so what they do is they manipulate the individual bits of a single value. Again, we have a couple of values, which we'll call alpha and omega. And this time, we will have our bit set encompass 16 bits instead of 8. The first of the unary operators we're going to look at is the right shift. The right shift operation is represented by a greater than symbol twice in a row. In this case, we're going to shift the value omega to the right by 3. And if we look at this visually, we'll see that what happens is that the three rightmost bits are dropped from the value. In their place on the left, we extend the current values, which happen to be zeros, yielding a value of 10011, or 25 in decimal. We can also left shift, which uses the less than symbol twice in a row. So if we left shift omega by 3 bits, we'll see that zeros are added on the right and all the bits are shifted to the left. This yields a value of 10011001000 or 1640 in decimal. It's worth considering what happens if we shift a value past the end of the number of bits that that type holds. For example, if we took an unsigned character, which is one byte on typical systems, eight bits, and we shifted it left in this fashion. If you guess that the extra bits are truncated, that they're dropped, then you guessed correctly. If this value had been an unsigned character, the resulting value would have been 11001000. In other words, we would have lost those three high bits because of the shift. Finally, we have what we refer to as the complement, which is represented with the tilde, and this is effectively the negation of each bit, one at a time. If we take the negation of alpha, it will flip every existing bit. Now, this is a little easier to do from the right to the left, so I'm going to change our order for just a moment. What that means is that the 1 becomes a 0, the 0 becomes a 1, the 1 becomes a 0, the 1 becomes a 0, the 0 becomes a 1, the 0 becomes a 1, and the 1 becomes a 0, and finally the 1 becomes a 0. Now, with that said, remember this is a 16-bit value. So all those extra values, well, they switch from a 0 to a 1. But if you look at the decimal value, something weird is happening. This is a negative. And that's because this is the 2's complement representation of this number. In other words, it's a negative value because the leftmost bit is a 1. Now, you might be asking yourself, how is this actually useful in practice? Well, if you've ever worked with binary data, for example from files, you may already be seeing some implications. But the usefulness of this kind of approach goes beyond just binary data storage. And one of the more common approaches is the use of what we call bit fields. A bit field, or a bit set as it's sometimes called, is just a collection of bits that are stored together. The purpose of this is to allow us to use bits as flags. They represent a yes or no value, an on or off value, or a true or false value. These are often stored as unsigned types, an unsigned character is 8 bits, typically an unsigned short is typically 16 bits, an unsigned integer is typically 32 bits, and so on and so forth, but of course this depends on the architecture. And bit fields are great for optimizing memory and storing or transmitting data. They allow us to compress a lot of information into a very small space. They effectively cut the memory use to around 1 8th compared to a typical Boolean representation. So let's take an example from a game. Let's say you're creating an adventure game, and the main character has an inventory. There's a total of eight items. A lighter, a pistol, a crowbar, a drill, a laser, a shark, a knife, and a book. We could represent those using eight individual Boolean values, or we can have a single unsigned character that will hold the same data. Now, the one drawback of using bit fields is that they sometimes take a little bit of time to wrap your head around. Even though performance-wise they're much more effective, understanding them takes a little bit more effort. Let's take a look at our adventure game again. We want our player to pick up the lighter, the crowbar, and the shark. In order to do so, we simply access the array elements, 0 for the lighter, 2 for the crowbar, 
and 5 for the shark, and set them to true. For the unsigned character, we use a bitwise OR operation, OR equals, in order to add a bit to the set. If it was already on, we leave it on. If it wasn't on, we turn it on. If we take our items variable, OR equals hex value 1, that effectively turns on bit 0, which has a value of 1. If we do the same thing with hex value 4, that's the value of bit number 2. And then if we do the same thing with hex value 20 or decimal 32, that's bit 5. The operation going on is effectively the same, but we're doing it with a bit instead of with a Boolean array. This can get a little bit difficult to follow and to work with, and it can be a little bit inflexible. So what we'll often do is create an enumeration with readable names, but assigned to the bitwise values. In this case, lighter is 1, pistol is 2, crowbar is 4, drill is 8, laser is 16, or hex 10, shark is 32, knife is 64, and book is 128. Because these are individual bits, they are powers of 2. Of course, if we want to drop a value with a Boolean array, this is pretty simple. You just reassign that value to false. With a bit field, it's a little bit more complicated. We have to effectively turn off a particular bit. The way we usually do this is we take the value we're trying to remove. We take its complement. In other words, we flip the zeros to ones and the ones to zeros. And that will effectively represent an array with all ones except a zero representing shark. And then we apply the AND operation. This effectively will keep all of the bits from items that are already on, that already represent true or that the character has that item, except shark. If the items value contains the bit for shark, it will not be on afterwards. Let's take an example here. We said before that our character had the lighter, the crowbar, and the shark. So bits 0, 2, and 5, respectively, are currently on, and all the other bits are off. We take the complement of the shark value. This results in 1101, 1111. And then we take the AND value of those two. So 0 and 1 becomes 0, 0 and 1 becomes 0. 1 and 0 becomes 0, and 0 and 1 becomes 0. So our first four bits become all zeros. The second four bits, 0 and 1 is 0, 1 and 1 is 1, 0 and 1 is 0, and 1 and 1 is 1. So our last four bits are 0, 1, 0, 1. This results in the character's inventory array continuing to hold the lighter and the crowbar, but no longer containing the bit for the shark. Hopefully this gives you a pretty concrete example of how we can use bit fields in practice. But this is just one example of the use cases for bitwise operations. There are many more when it comes to storing data in files and transmitting data over a network.